Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Brief History Of and today we'll be looking at the killer fog of 1952. London, like almost every city on the planet, has had its fair share of pollution problems, so much so that there are rules and regulations on the types of vehicles that can travel within the city. For example, the low emission zone and the congestion charge. But there was a time before emissions regulation, and because of this, in 1952, almost 12,000 people died of pollution-related illnesses. There are a number of factors that caused the killer fog. Rather tragically, it all started with the windless, cold climate of London in December, mixed with an anti-cyclone. Due to the cold weather, many residents of the Greater London area used coal to heat their homes, in doing so releasing highly poisonous particulates into the air above the city. These conditions created the perfect cocktail for a deadly thick smog. On the 4th of December, an anticyclone settled over London caused by the lack of wind, creating a lid of warm air over the cold air, thus producing a thick persistent smog. Without the breeze of fresh air, the soot from chimney smoke and vehicle exhaust fumes mixed with the smog creating a yellow-black colour which was nicknamed pea soup. The use of low quality coal further exacerbated the problem as cheaper coal had higher levels of sulphur. Most homes couldn't afford the more expensive hard coals at the time. The amounts of particulates in the air was added to by the large power stations littered around central London. For example, Battersea Power Station, Lotts Road Power Station and the Bankside Power Station, all of which were within three and a half miles of Trafalgar Square. There are claims that the soot reducing measures at Battersea Power Station actually caused more sulphur to be expelled into the air, although this hasn't been confirmed. Reportedly, the air was so thick that you couldn't see more than a few metres in front of you, thus making driving and walking in London very dangerous indeed. Only the London Underground ran with some regularity, and the ambulance service completely ceased to function, meaning that patients had to transport themselves to hospital. As the smog continued into the second and third days, visibility reduced in some areas down to less than a metre during daytime, and at night, the incandescent street lamps had little to no light penetration. The smog even entered people's homes, and the theatres closed their doors due to being unbearable for audiences. Which is saying something. As much as I love London theatres, they aren't the most comfortable places. The smog lasted from the 5th to the 9th of December when winds finally blew the smog out into the North Sea, but the after effects lasted way longer. Initially, the increase in deaths was put down to an influenza epidemic because at the time, pea soup smog was fairly regular and many people didn't think much about the risks in breathing in the deadly polluted air. Only a few well-off people could afford proper gas masks. The original estimates from the government claimed around 4,000 people died as a direct result of the smog. Deaths attributed to the fogs were mainly pneumonia, bronchitis, tuberculosis and heart failure. Modern day figures penned the death toll at around 12,000, but worse still, around 100,000 people were said to have been affected by the smog mainly by having respiratory related conditions for the rest of their lives. The Great Smog of London, as it was eventually known as, hastened the growing environmental movement and helped to change the people's attitudes towards effects of burning high sulphur and black smoke creating fuels. This eventually led to the Clean Air Act of 1956, which only permitted smokeless fuels to be used in certain areas within the city. Alternatives to coal for domestic heating only started to become popular in the 1960s, with gas and electric heating becoming more prevalent. Many of the large power stations continued, some even as late as the early 2000s, for example the Lotts Road power station, albeit in a modernised gas burning form. The air in London did improve over the years with the introduction of more efficient vehicles, extensions to the underground network and cleaner methods of burning fuel, however killer smogs have blighted London since. Even this year has seen dangerous levels of pollution, but not thankfully on the same scale as 1952. Thank you very much for watching, do you live in a city that you think has large levels of pollution? I'd like to know so uh, leave a comment below. Did you enjoy the video? I hope you did. And if that's the case, please click subscribe, like and comment. And also, if you could, it would be absolutely amazing if you could share videos on any type of social media. And also, you can always follow me on Twitter, which is at plainly underscore D. Once again, thank you very much for watching.